All right, so thank you very much. As she mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit today about COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, but specifically, I'm going to concentrate on some of the endothelial dysfunction that may occur and why that may contribute to the coagulopathy that is seen. Um, I am definitely not an expert in this area, and this is a very huge topic, but I do love the endothelium. It is something we've looked at a little bit, um, and I think that you'll see that there's a lot of connections between what we've talked about in the endothelial cells with trauma and in the endothelium that happens in this situation as well. Um, so I think that these chief grand rounds are kind of that last chance for the department to get one look into each resident. And kind of understanding why they choose their topic helps give a little bit of important insight. Um, throughout the years, we've seen a lot of reoccurring themes in the chief talks that can help us as a resident decide what to talk about. We can choose a top topic that's insightful, just like Jonathan's two weeks ago. But I can, <laughs> I think we can all agree I'm not nearly as enlightened as Jonathan and not going to be able to present a topic like that. Then we want to choose a topic that's unique to us. Um, and what about us makes us a little bit different than the resident sitting next to us? I think most people know that probably the most unique thing about me is that I've had multiple jobs in medicine prior to becoming going on to medical school. Um, most notably, I was a PICU nurse for six years at Cincinnati Children's, but then also I was an EMT for a fire department for nine years, the last two of which I was a lieutenant in charge of training and education. Um, throughout college, I was a patient or a nurse's aide in a hospital. In high school, I was a patient care attendant at a nursing home. And then as a child, I've been a candy striper since I can remember just wanting to be in the hospital. So I thought, okay, well, I'll talk about like interdisciplinary teams. Maybe I could give some insight into that. Uh, so I told one of my co-residents that that's what I was going to talk about. And I like could see in her face, she was like, well, just make sure you like give it an interesting title or something because it could be really boring. <laughs> I looked into the research and she's right, it was really boring and even I was bored looking into it and decided that I really can sum up all my great advice into one fragmented sentence. Uh, be nice, treat each other with respect, don't be defensive and listen to each other and that would not be a 45 minute conversation. So then I asked around more. What, would, what about me? What should I present? And everyone assumed that I would talk about research that I did during my time. I think to know me is to know that I'm pretty obsessed with what we did. And um, But uh, Dr. Brown just gave a great talk about it a couple weeks or maybe a couple months ago. And I think you guys have all heard me talk about pulmonary thromboembolic events after blunt thoracic trauma numerous times. So I kind of wanted to figure out a way that I could still have a pertinent topic but something that I would also enjoy looking into and would help further my education. So I think COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, obviously this is definitely pertinent to our chief years. Um, our class, as well as the class last year, I think will be kind of defined by what happened during these last two years of our residency. And then passionate, I, obviously I love the endothelium and that way we can talk about just kind of the combination of both. So what does it mean to be a resident in the time of COVID? Um, we've had to deal with a lot of changing responsibilities and have kind of proven and been able to see who can be flexible with those changes. We've dealt with lonely patients, people in the PACU with no people, or patients in the PACU with no assistance afterwards, patients that have experienced major traumas alone. Um, Semi-finished areas of the hospital that we're now calling hospital wards. Um, virtual fellowship interviews will be something that we probably all remember and talk about from our chief years. Uh, inability for many of us to have seen our parents or our siblings since the beginning of this um, pandemic. Uh, inconsistent childcare. I think everyone knows I was in the trauma bay when I found out my daycare was closed the next day and freaking out on figuring out how to take care of children and being able to afford it. Um, we've had less bread and butter cases. Uh, I think that's also a big, we were talking yesterday, I did a umbilical hernia repair with mesh at Kaiser and the attendees like, how do you like to do these? And I was like, hmm, haven't done one of these since COVID started because we haven't really been doing those bread and butter cases. Um, waiting for COVID test results, deciding when we should operate on patients positive patients, and then taking care of a disease that not only we don't know anything about, but also our mentors and our attendees don't really know much about. Um, so moving on though, we'll talk about COVID-19 associated coagulopathy and give a general, general introduction into what that really means. Then we'll briefly discuss viral entry, some proposed mechanisms of endothelial dysfunction. And again, these are proposed mechanisms. This hasn't been proven yet. Um, and then I have a couple conclusions at the end. 
So as we all know, there is a wide range in the clinical response that is seen in patients with severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Although most patients with the disease, COVID-19, will present with a mild upper respiratory tract infection and then recover, there are some patients that will develop a long-lasting symptoms. Commonly, our discussion of these patients leads to the severe respiratory complications that occur in this patient population. But today I wanna to concentrate on the coagulopathy that is also seen in patients with severe COVID-19. Several reports have shown a high incidence of both venous and arterial thromboembolic events in patients that have experienced severe COVID-19. The numbers are kind of all over the place, but in general, and these are kind of maybe some of the more conservative numbers, thromboembolisms are diagnosed in the critically ill ICU patients around 25% of the time and is associated with a mortality of 40%. There's also an increased incidence of thrombo embolic events despite being on appropriate, or what we would think is appropriate thromboprophylaxis. We see uh, one report of about 31% of patients who are on prophylaxis still develop a clot. And interestingly, 81% of the time, that clot was a pulmonary emboli. Um, we've also noticed that there's been a trend towards early diagnosis of pulmonary emboli and thrombotic events. So we talked about this in trauma too. Generally, these events are diagnosed on average around three to four days later because you first need to have time to form the clot and then allow it to break off to become through the lungs. But in this situation, we're seeing it about 50% of the time being diagnosed very early in the first 24 hours after admission, a thing that we mentioned in trauma as well. Um, and then autopsy data is starting to come in. And we're seeing that um, one report shows that about 58% of autopsies showed evidence of pulmonary embolism. And it was thought to be the direct cause of death in 33% of those patients. So in, gen in general, patients that develop coagulopathy and severe COVID-19 already automatically have a higher morbidity and mortality than those that did not experience a clot, up to about five times higher than individuals without thrombotic complications. COVID-19 coagulopathy is characterized by an increased D-dimer, which is just a reminder, is fibrin degradation products that are released when plasmin cleaves the cross-link fibrin. You'll also see an increase in fibrinogen there's a mild thrombocytopenia, so around numbers about 100 to 150,000. Um, we'll see an increase in LDH. And then there's some report of an increase in prothrombin time. So they took admission uh, laboratory data in survivors versus non-survivors and found in the non-survivors they presented with a slightly higher prothrombin time. Um, but normal APTT times. And then in, in more detailed reports that looked at some atypical markers, they found an increase in factor eight, von Wildebrand's factor, um, and P selectant. And those ones are the ones that I'll go into a little bit more in detail later. Um, so COVID-19 associated coagulopathy appears to be very different than the classic DIC that is associated with inflammatory conditions such as sepsis. Classic DIC also has an elevated D-dimer, but not as high as what we see in COVID-19 associated coagulopathy. It has a more severe thrombocytopenia and a, and a more uh, profound um, effect on your normal markers of coagulation. So increased PT and APTT. Also, there is a decrease in your fibrinogen. And then uh, kind of interestingly in DIC, bleeding complications are common as well as thrombotic complications. But bleeding complications are actually relatively uncommon in patients with COVID-19 associated coagulopathy. So then I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, viral injury. So this is kind of going to take you back to medical school a little bit here. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 virus is able to infect human spell cells by binding its spike protein, which is first primed by the type 2 transmembrane serine protease, or TMPRSS2 that you'll hear, to the ACE2 enzyme, or the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is expressed abundantly on several different cell types. 
After the viron binds to this receptor, it is then brought into the cell through the process of endocytosis. At the same time, there is also activation of the ADAM17 taste pathway, and this will result in downregulation of the ACE2 receptor on that cell and loss of its protective functions, and we'll go into that a little bit more later. The SARS-2 CoV virin then uses the host ribosomes to initiate replication and then subsequent transcription of the different viral product or pieces. It then takes that subgenomic transcript to the endoplasmic reticulum where it makes the protein, puts it into the Golgi apparatus, assembles it into the virus, puts it into a vesicle, has it come to the cell wall, and then, re and then through exocytosis le releases it into the, blood or into the bloodstream to allow it to infect more adjacent cells that have the ACE2 receptors. All cells that express ACE2 are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection and the downstream effects of the reduced ACE2 levels. Namely, this, occur this results in an inflammatory inflammation and injury. Furthermore, the disruption of ACE2 appears to be an important factor associated with organ injury. There is evidence that shows that variations in the expression of ACE2 may actually influence your susceptibilities to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as variations in your own gen um, genetic uh, response for inflammation and in your immune responses. So then we'll talk about some proposed mechanism of endothelial dysfunction um, and the pathophysiology that leads to that. So this is just a summary slide of very general categories for proposed mechanisms of just COVID-19. So we have direct cytotoxic effects. We can have a dysregulation of the R8 or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We have endothelial cell damage and thromboinflammation and then dysregulated immune response. Moving forward, I'm going to concentrate on endothelial cell damage and thromboinflammation. These obviously all overlap, um, and you really cannot talk about one of these without the others, but every single one of these categories is a huge conversation or a huge topic that really would deserve its own talk. So we'll kind of talk about how it affects endothelial cell damage. So first, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This is um, this is a system that is obviously intimately involved in regulating fluid status and hemostasis. So we've learned this in medical school. Normally, you have angiotensinogen, which is cleaved by renin to angiotensin 1. Then the ACE enzyme turns that into angiotensin 2, where it has the ability to bind with the AT1R receptor and result in tissue injury. But we have the ACE2 enzyme that will then con convert angiotensin 1 and 2 into angiotensin 1, 9 and 1, 7, where it can bind to the mass receptor and have a tissue protective effect. So you can see that without this enzyme, you would actually result in more tissue injury. We also have direct viral induced cytotoxicity of the endothelium. So ACE2 expression has been demonstrated on the arterial and venous endothelium. Generically, like in medical school, we're taught that the endothelial cells make up this one cell layer thick protective barrier of the blood vessel. Very simple, right? But in, in reality, the endothelial cell actually has numerous functions. It is intimately involved in angiogenesis, leukocyte trafficking, inflammation, um, smooth muscle cell proliferation, vascular permeability and glomerular filtration, vascular tone, and hemostasis. Several reports have shown evidence of direct endothelial cell infection, resulting in an accumulation of inflammatory cells as well as apoptotic cell death. In this first, whoops, first panel here, we have electron microscopy images of kidney tissues that show viral inclusion bodies and the endothelium of the capillaries of the glomeruli. In this middle section, this is um, actually a small bowel resection from a patient with symptomatic COVID-19. And you can see, again, evidence of endothelial cell apoptosis. 
And in these last section, we have a postmortem lung sections um, that are stained here with H and E. And then down here, they actually use a caspase three stain. And again, show patterns that are consistent with apoptosis of the endothelial cells. Infected endothelial cells lose their ability to maintain their normal physiologic functions and result in this procoagulant change of the vascular lumen, the formation of immunothrombosis, and, my, and organ mal circulation. There are also indirect mechanisms of um, endothelial dysfunction. Now, um, this, the, every single one of these is a huge topic, but just briefly, other things that can result in endothelial cell dysfunction are hypoxia, cytokine release and immune, immune dysregulation, and then the formation of nets. Um, hypoxia is one of the hallmarks of COVID-19, causes the endothelial cells to switch from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, and can result in the formation of reactive oxygen species, leading to intracellular oxidative stress, acidosis, and acidosis, causing endothelial dysfunction. Cytokine release and immune dysregulation is particularly seen in those that can develop severe COVID-19 disease associated with respiratory failure, sepsis, and shock. Chemokines and inflammatory mediators are released locally in the area of infection and cause subsequent movement of the neutrophils and monocytes from the bloodstream into the injured tissue. But the excessive release of these can then lead to further in, in damage of systemic endothelial cells, um, kind of this downward spiral of a systemic disease. Additionally, neutrophil extracellular traps, also known as NETs, may represent another important method for endothelial dysfunction. Under normal condition, NETs immobilize and kill microorganisms. But if not properly regulated, they have the potential to induce, in, induce endothelial cell activation and dysfunction, further propagating inflammation in the vessel wall, potentially driving thrombotic events. But all of, so all of these result in endothelial dysfunction. And what actually happens in when the endothelium is not working? One proposed mechanism is this idea of exocytosis. So the infection activates the endothelial cells, triggering the exocytosis, or the release of preformed granules, which can simultaneously activate two pathways. It will activate microvascular inflammation and microvascular thrombosis. Um, this is a very rapid response. So the endothelial cells has an egg, an, an agonist, any kind of different, many multiple different types of agonists that cause this activation. And then they release these weevil pallid bodies. Weevil pallid bodies are the granules that contain von Wildebrand's factor, factor VIII, P-selectin, and multiple other pro-inflammatory cytokines. During exocytosis, endothelial cells will release these into the bloodstream and mediate platelet adherence and aggregation, as well as leukocyte adherence to the vessel wall. And then this, I actually took this slide right out of the trauma or, or presentations that we've given before, but it was also noted in multiple, um, multiple uh, reports on COVID-19 as well. So P-selectin is a member of the selectin family of cell adhesion molecules or CAMs and is known to specifically contribute to fibrin deposition um, in various procoagulant disorders such as coronary artery disease, stroke, angina, TTP, DIC, and then I'd also say in pulmonary thrombosis following trauma. Following endothelial activation, P-selectin binds to the PSGL1 receptor on leukocytes and platelets, thereby propagating coagulation, thrombosis, and inflammation. Interestingly, there's been investigative thrombus studies that have shown that if you give a P-selectin blocking antibody, this would result in a decrease of fibrin accumulation by 50 to 70% in that forming clot. Additionally, soluble levels of P-selectin have been noted to be elevated in patients with COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, um, a finding that is consistent with many other thromb prothrombotic conditions. But P-selectin can also interact with von Wildebrand's factor and work together to promote circulation. So we know that can, 
uh, after exocytosis, the P-selectin can be displayed here on the endothelial surface, where it will then interact with these ultra-long multimers of von Willebrand's factors. These ultra-long multimers unfurl and can kind of and can catch these platelets, um, resulting in platelet aggregation and thrombosis, kind of resembling this beads on a string appearance. And then again, as mentioned previously, they also bind leukocytes and result in the release of IL-6 and other inflammatory mediators. Additionally, Weibel pallid bodies are known to contain angiopoietin-2, which has been also reported to be increased in patients with COVID-19-associated coagulopathy. Angiopoietin-2, its main function is actually to be an antagonist of angiopoietin-1. So under normal conditions, angiopoietin-1 binds to the T2 receptor, where it will then inhibit or has an anti-inflammatory effect, an anti-apoptotic effect, um, and then also stabilizes the cell or the cell cell junctions. When released, angiopoietin-2 is released from the Weibel pallid bodies and it blocks this interaction and therefore has an inflammatory and apoptotic and then also causes destabilization of these cell cell junctions. So exocytosis results in parallel activation of inflammation and thrombotic pathways. So we have the release of von Willebrand's factor in B-selectin, which initiates leukocyte and platelet adherence to the capillary and cell walls, which then leads to microvascular obstruction, microthrombosis, and vascular inflammation. This then causes the release of cytokines such as IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, which can then further cause more endothelial exocytosis. In other words, coronavirus can initiate va in vascular injury and endothelial exocytosis perpetuate this cycle of injury, inflammation, and potentially contribute to the prolonged hyperinflammatory response that is seen. There's another similar mechanism that is proposed secondary to the release of von Willebrand's factor that involves its interaction, the interaction of von Willebrand's factor with its protease, Adams TS13. So we know Adams TS13 um, because of the role that it plays in the, in the disease TTP, which is an extreme example of a deficiency of that enzyme leading to the accumulation of these ultra-long multimers of von Willebrand's factor. So normally, Adams TS13 is a metalloprotease that regulates the biological activity of von Willebrand's factor by cleaving these prothrombotic ultra-long multimers into just high molecular weight multimers. Under normal hemostatic conditions, there is a re reciprocal relationship between these ultra-long von Willebrand's factor multimers and the Adams TS activity. So if you need more of these to help with hemostasis, then this activity will slow down. And then if you no longer need them for hemostasis, the activity, the cleavage activity of the Adams TS13 will increase, decrease the, these prothrombotic ultra-long multimers. Abnormal ratios have been implicated in several prothrombotic conditions, as well as inflammatory conditions as, and some metabolic disorders. Patients with systemic inflammation have been shown to have decreased Adams TS13 activity proportional to their inflammatory response, resulting in an imbalance in the Adams TS13 activity and the von Willebrand's factor uh, accumulation, causing organ malperfusion and death. Furthermore, we know that IL-6 activity can actually de or IL-6 can decrease the activity of Adams TS13. Several studies have looked at this in patients with COVID-19 and have shown that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can, is associated with markedly elevated von Willebrand's levels, as well as below normal activity of Adams TS13. Therefore, one proposed mechanism is that SARS-CoV-2 could cause endothelial activation and damage, leading to abundant von Willebrand's factor release overwhelming the presence of the Adams TS13. 
compounding this with the pro-inflammatory mediators that are released that also decrease the activity of the Adams TS13 protein. So in conclusions, microvascular thrombi are commonly observed in patients with severe COVID-19 and contribute significantly to morbidity and mortality. While the mechanisms of coagulopathy is still under investigation, the endothelium has become an important battleground for SARS-CoV-2 as a common link between inflammation and thrombosis. Endothelial dysfunction results in a global condition in which the endothelium loses its physiologic properties, such as the control of hemostasis, vascular permeability, fibrinolysis, and platelet anti-aggregation. But it is important to remember that it is still just one piece in this great, greater process that leads to coagulopathy. Morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 remains high, and new therapeutic strategies are needed, possibly to stabilize the endothelium in conjunction with specific antiviral administration, could, and possibly representing a promising therapeutic strategy to decrease fatality. Oh, and just want to thank a couple people. Um, definitely Dr. Brown. Um, I think everyone that knows him knows that I was incredibly lucky to work with him. He's been an amazing mentor and friend and um, has pushed me to do things that I never knew were possible. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Galante. Um, he's also been an incredible mentor, uh, a really good sponsor, um, and just uh, has seen things in me that I did not see and um, my class my original class and as well as our new class but like Jonathan said we don't really have very many pictures of our new formed class because of COVID um, but it's been really great having a new formed class and then my kids and my husband that's it take questions Outstanding work. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Just a couple of questions I have. I think you really <laughs> hit it on the head. Two of the challenges, I think, uh, specifically in studying this. One is that the action is really at the interface. So when you're trying to study it, you need tissue because blood's not going to give you everything you need, which makes it hard to do it in the human model. 
you also need the animal model, I think, uh, as well, because one of the other issues is the mechanistic redundancy that you're trying to overcome when, you, when you're treating. You, you identified several different pathways by which you activate nets and, and things like that. So I guess the real question is if you had limited resources, where would you put your money down? Uh, animal model, human tissue, and, and what would the approach be? I think the most important slide of this entire thing is really this last picture that I breezed through. And so because of this, if I had limited resources, I think that the, I guess I'd have to say the animal model, and I guess I'm a little partial to animal models, um, but that allows you to at least talk, talk about the interface between all of these instead of just looking at one piece. Now, that has a downfall because a uh, mouse's response to inflammation and coagulation is not going to be exactly the same, obviously, as yours and mine, where they have to be able to clot off their tail within five seconds when they're running away from the cat. Um, so uh, there's that, that's, that's not perfect. Tails, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's definitely not perfect, but um, definitely more my. Well, it's also interesting to see how some of the long term effects of COVID are related to issues related to gas the vasculature mm -hmm. and also how children are responding differently. And yeah, and that, that actually came up a lot in just through my look, uh, my literature search, uh, the response to children, which you don't hear. I mean, for the most part, they do really well, um, but the increases in the vasculitis that is seen and then Kawasaki's disease that they've seen and some other interesting um, connections and with the, the vasculature. Of that may be on there. It'll be I think it'll be interesting to see all the long-term effects that we're going to see from this um, in patients that have had COVID in 10, 15, 20 years. So that's actually what I was going to comment on. There is reasonable biologic plausibility that the long haulers are actually people who have chronic and sustained inflammation. And so um, there is a huge interest because we now probably have developed a group of people who are going to have new long-term comorbidities and complications, both affecting the heart, the lung, and peripheral tissue. Um, it's a little bit unknown how long the inflammatory state uh, in terms of coagulation will persist. Mm -hmm. But the NIH is so interested in this that they've committed $1.2 billion with a B over the next four years um, to actually study the long hauler patient population. Yeah. And, um, Dr. Brown and I are part of an application for an, a grant that's going in as a center here um, that we're hoping that we get as a center to study those uh, four effects. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I don't know that we can go on a really long time. Oh, Scar, come on. <laughs> I just uh, I can't resist asking. So, I mean, for those of us taking care of patients, we just discussed the case of a guy a month out from COVID and yeah. who knows, maybe he had a thrombotic complication. What what do we do for the patients? How long are they at risk? Should we use antiplatelet agents? Should we just stick with conventional anticoagulation? Well, that's the, um, <laughs> it's a great question and one that I'm not going to be able to answer right away. Um, but I know that Dr. Kalka is probably getting up to say this, but there's actually current studies being done to figure that out and to look at it. You know what yeah, I gave this lecture to the residents yeah. last week about what to do with these patients. Um, there's multiple ongoing clinical trials now, both in the inpatient and outpatient environment, to try to understand what we should do. Um, the inpatient trial for full anticoagulation in moderately injured patients uh, showed a survival benefit, but in the severely ill patients, it was stopped early for futility and potentially harm. So there's sort of this very narrow window. Uh, the data hasn't been published yet, except in, in um, news reports and, and press releases. So we're waiting for that. And But there's an outpatient arm to that as well for the people who are post-hospitalization, how long should they be treated? And then there's a separate group looking at the antiplatelet therapy. So we don't know. There's also some clinical trials looking at things that stabilize the endothelium and anti-T-selectin antibodies and those things as well. Additives. You know, when you guys first started talking about T-selectin, I was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tell a little joke. My husband's not medical at all, and it was like April of the COVID pandemic, and he like texted me, and he's like, well, what about T-selectin? And I was like, just because you have a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail. And then all of a sudden, all this literature starts coming out. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that was, that was a fantastic review. Thank you very much. One of the interesting things that I have observed in these patients is that the young ones that we put on ECMO mm -hmm. is the location they're forming these clots. The younger patients that we've seen that we've put on ECMO, they got the clot in the right ventricle, huge clot in the right ventricle, which I have never seen in younger patients, huh. yeah, which is very, very kind of, for me, surprising that the location where yeah. this particular inflammatory response, endothelial damage, everything is causing areas that you would never ever expect to form a clot, you form a clot. Yeah, I don't know much about the endothelial differences in the different areas of the heart, but I think it'd be interesting to see if there's like a difference. Totally, yeah. Makeup of yeah. And, and we've, we've noticed it because they come in, they get respiratory failure and they're as we're putting the, in um, on, on ECMO, as we're cannulating them, yeah. on the TE, we see there's a huge clot in the right ventricle. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting and important observation, yeah. right? How would you do the yes. transplant? <laughs> <laughs> so you need some tissue from the right ventricle. Yeah. Exactly right. Well, yeah. So that's probably where it is. So it's a lower pressure situation, so it's not as active as the, as the left heart. Exactly. And it's probably that the endothelium We're not submitting to that proposal, but people are going to make their careers on this. So for people who are interested in this, there'll be plenty of opportunity. Um, <laughs> the NIH, half of that, um, or a large portion of that money is going actually for a um, one or more centers for a biospecimen core that people could then submit to to request sampling from. And we have some samples here in pathology. We're not going to apply for that core for a variety of reasons. The application, they gave everyone two-week deadlines. So, but somebody is going to have these samples, and they're going to try to co-locate these so outside groups can apply to get those samples. No, this is from online. This is just a couple comments I thought I'd uh, share. So, um, Dr. Raskin comments, this is an insightful talk, Linda. You are a superstar. I'm looking forward to working with you in your fellowship and beyond. Bravo. And Dr. Evans comments, excellent talk, Linda. Very interesting. I agree with Dr. Kiai. Lots of RV thrombosis in fully anticoagulated patients. I have also seen spontaneous clot formation in the aorta as well. And, a COVID patient that had significant aortic inflammation. Yeah, there's something that we got to think about to get it to shoot from. Um, I mean, so many patients are passing away. And we have the equipment in the lab now to do this uh, markers for various different inflammatory markers and stuff like that. So if someone's interested or gets tissue or whatever, let Ian and I know because we have that. Thank you again, Linda. Thank you. Thank you.